for sure. Looking better than ever. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Took you guys forever to get here. Jeez. <laughs> Just kidding. Let's pray. Let's bring this night in with a prayer and get started in worship. Father, we thank you so much for this evening, Lord. I thank you that you've brought everybody safely here tonight, um, that you've blessed us with your presence. And Father, we just uh, want you to be glorified. We want you to be magnified in our hearts. We surrender ourselves to your will tonight, and I pray that as we sing to you, as your word says, you will inhabit the praises of your people, that you would be pleased, and it would be a pleasing aroma to your great and glorious throne. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. And you guys can stay seated. If you want to stand, you can stand. Let's just worship the Lord together. All the depths of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments. How untraceable his paths. Who knows the mind of our God? Who could bring counsel to him? Who is given to God that God should repay? For from him, through him, to him is everything. To God be the glory forever and ever. Sky 
our gratitude in our hearts. I just want to speak the name of 
of Jesus. Sing this tonight. Over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. And I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom There is, I speak Jesus Let's stand up tonight. I, uh, we all don't know each other's families in and out, but <clears throat> let's sing that verse again. And let's pray it in truly for our families. And maybe we're the one in the family that needs it. But let's truly sing and speak Jesus over our families. I just lost an aunt two nights ago from a self-inflicted wound. And we all know what it's like to lose somebody, but the time that we have here is precious. May we remind each other of that. And as we think of our lost family members or the family members that are frustrating us, and it doesn't have to be your, your blood family, it can be the body of Christ for sure as we can frustrate each other more than anybody else at times. But as we sing the rest of this song, let's sing it out. Let's sing it for our families. Let's sing it for ourselves. Let's sing it for against the addictions. Let's sing it against the depression. And believe it. Because we do believe, God, that your mighty power breaks these strongholds in our life. You've set all of us free from great strongholds. We thank you, Jesus. Jesus from the mountain. Sing it to him. Jesus in the street. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family. Speak the holy name. Jesus in 
the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family. Father, we humble ourselves before you tonight, knowing that there's no power in our tongue in and of itself. The power is in your name and your name alone. And we beg you, God, to help us, to help our families. Lord, we pray that they would be saved. We pray that they would be set free from whatever it is that's holding them down. We pray that for ourselves, Lord, but as, as Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. Help us to look to you and trust that tonight as we study your word. We thank you, God, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray, and everybody said. Gotta load it. I don't have it loaded. <laughs> I promise I will do it next week. I promise. I'll do it on Sunday morning. Okay, I'll do it on Sunday. I need to be more prepared. Yeah. Just, you just tell him you'll do it if he's here. If he ain't here, we're not doing it. <laughs> All right. Well, everybody get your Bibles ready. I don't know. Pins. I'm dropping all kinds of things. It's okay. All right. Let's dance. So we're going to, we're going to, between uh, this week and next week, we'll wrap up Jackie's Therapy. So we'll be in Genesis chapter 1 in two weeks. So uh, um, if you guys stay with us that long, you'll, we'll be back into the word in Genesis chapter 1. So I want to remind us about how we deal with our disagreements. This is uh, something we can always keep in our minds. So uh, if we want to run that slide, a godly guideline for how to deal with our disagreements. So first thing, uh, prayer. Bathing the moment in prayer, making sure we focus on prayer. Um, my wife has all the, the repeat letters. If you guys can't see it, I don't know if I can make it any bigger. So get closer. Okay. 
So, uh, number one, request, uh, always invite the Holy Spirit into your discussion. Number two, perspective. Repeat the perspective respectfully of the person you're listening to. Try to listen to uh, what's being spoken. Listen first, question later. Uh, the third one is uh, refrain from arrogant arguments. So we don't want to be those who answer first before we hear. So we listen patiently until we have heard the whole of the matter. Uh, we want to try to recognize that we all come to the word of God with glasses on. Do we know that? Do we all know we have presuppositions when we open up the Bible? You have yours, I have mine. Some have different ones than we have. So we want to recognize that. And this is where, in the area of presupposition, this is where your systems begin to dictate. So there are multiple systems, and people ask me all the time, well, Jackie, why are we going to talk about a system? Well, isn't the best system no system? Well, sort of. Uh, my favorite is no system, but no system is a system. Now, what I mean is, what a system does, it doesn't tell you how to interpret the Bible. Okay? A system does not tell you how to interpret the Bible. A system fills in the gaps. Are you guys aware there are gaps in the Bible? You guys got a Bible in front of you? Here's an easy one to look up. So let's look up... Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, you guys should all be familiar with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we'll jump into verse 13, sorry there's not a slide for that because I'm already off script. <clears throat> so 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 13, but we do not want you to be uninformed brothers about, uh, about those who are asleep that you might grieve as others do who have no hope for since we believe that jesus died and rose again even so through jesus god will bring with him those who have fallen asleep for this we declare to you by the word of the lord we who are alive who are left until the coming of the lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep for the lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and the voice of an archangel and the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Every system of Orthodox Christianity believes every word I just read. Now, if you pay attention to every word I just read, there are some words that aren't there that you believe, right? Like when does it happen? Um, those are the things that our systems tell us. Now, a system does it by looking at biblical theology. So it takes the biblical record everywhere the Bible talks about a particular subject. They put all of that together and they try to draw the line through so we can connect the dots. Are you guys with me? Now, those things, systems are man-made. We make those. And some of them are, are better than others, I think. <laughs> so, But we need to know those things are not arguing over what the Bible says. Systems are about... How do we connect the dots? Is it, you guys understand? So when I talk about dispensationalism, it's a system of how to connect the dots. When I talk about progressive covenantalism, it's a system to connect the dots. The reason I tell you about them is so you can make a decision because you know that there's more than one system out there. Are you tracking with me? Oh, you might say, oh, I don't know why I care. Well, one day, someone's going to ask you a question out of the Bible. And you're going to go look it up, and you're going to read the verse, and you're still not going to have an answer. And you're going to go online, and you're going to go type into got questions. How many knows got questions? Well, some of you send me got questions stuff, so I know you guys know. So got questions is going to answer your question according to their system. Now, that may be good. But sometimes we think 
that that's the answer because that's what the Bible says when that's the answer because that's what the system says. Have you ever looked up that try to find an answer to a question on more than one website and had more than one answer? Do you know why that is? Because there are different systems and different solutions to the problem. Everyone believes what the Bible says. Let me back that up. Every believer in Jesus Christ believes what the Bible says. Does every believer believe in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, it says we are not appointed to wrath. Does everyone believe that? So why is there any disagreement? Because people don't know what wrath is. What do you say wrath is? Some people say when you read the book of Revelation, wrath starts in chapter 4. When John is told to come up here. Have you guys heard that before? When John is told come up here, then they say that's the beginning of wrath before the first seal is open. But when you read Revelation 6, you know the word wrath's not there until you get to the end. So we argue over timing. And the answers to those questions are birthed out of systems. How we connect the dots. And if we want to be a serious student of the word where we understand how to give answers, then we, part of that is understanding where are the answers coming from. Are you guys, you guys understand what I mean? So, like, when you went to school and you asked a question about math, two plus two is four, that's a philosophy. Anybody ever do philosophy in school? That's probably what my problem is, because I really like philosophy. So, when you do philosophy, there was oftentimes... A lot of different ways to think through issues. And thinking through those issues and how we do it is uh, something that uh, I think the Bible challenges us all to do, right? Then the Bible tells us to be good students of the word, right? So we want to try as much as we are able to be good students of the word. So when we're thinking about systems and we're having an in house discussion, what we shouldn't do is shoot at the other guy. You guys ever heard of church history? You know, the first couple of guys who wanted to make the Bible in a common tongue so that everyone could read it were burnt at the stake by church people. So just so you know, it's not new. We have this weird thing if everybody doesn't think like we think or or put the pieces together like we put them together, the next thing you do, people are piling up heaps of wood. You ever walk into a meeting, just look around, see if there's a big stack of wood with a stick in the middle, you may not want to be at the meeting. <laughs> Church history is full of that. So we want to be able to understand we're not fighting over whether the Bible's true, we're fighting over how does it fit, the things Jesus didn't tell us. Right? You guys remember that, right? You guys all read the book of Matthew? You familiar with Matthew 24? You remember Jesus saying, I know exactly the day I'm returning? Is that what he said? What did he say? He says, nobody knows the day when I'm coming back. Only the Father in heaven, right? Isn't that what he said? And then how many people have you heard try to tell you what day he's coming back? So... All right, we, 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 we want to hold fast. Bible's a final arbiter. That's what we're holding on to. So when we look at systems and we discuss those systems, what we're asking is which one is following the Bible, seems to be following the Bible in the simplest way. That's how I look. And so that's what we're talking about. So I want to finish up dispensationalism. We got a few slides on the seven dispensations they're up on the screen. The first one is the dispensation of innocence. Just so you guys can be aware of dispensationalism. Uh, uh, the view on uh, the dispensation of innocence runs from Genesis, uh, basically Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 1 and 2. What are the commands we see in this uh, dispensation? God's commands to fill the earth with children, subdue the earth, have dominion over the animals, care for the garden, abstain from eating the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then God warned of the punishment of physical and spiritual death for disobedience. This dispensation ended when Adam fell. Okay? Then you enter into the next dispensation. That's 
the dispensation of conscience. Uh, that runs from Genesis 3 through Genesis 8. So we look here. What are the five major aspects of conscience? Uh, the curse on the serpent, the change uh, in womanhood and childbearing, a curse on nature, the imposing of difficult work on mankind to produce food, and the promise of Christ. The, the proto, I used to say proto-evangelicum, and somebody told me I'm saying that wrong. It's proto-euangelion. So, but it's, well, that fancy word just means the first mention of the gospel. Okay, so the seed of the woman, human, a human being is going to deliver humans from sin. First, first promise, Genesis 3.15. Okay, for dispensationalists, that's in the dispensation of conscience. It's the beginning of the redemption story. It ends with the destruction of the world through the flood. The third dispensation is human government. It runs from uh, the flood to Abraham. Genesis 8 through Genesis 11 uh, has various promises and commands. First, God will not curse the earth again. Noah and his family are going to replenish the earth with people. They will have dominion over animal creation. They're allowed to eat meat. The law of capital punishment is established. There never will be another worldwide flood. The sign of God's promise will be the rainbow. It ends with Noah and his family failed, uh, uh, which brought ultimately the Tower of Babel and the confusion of the languages. And that takes us to the covenant of promise. The covenant of promise, from the covenant of promise forward in dispensationalism, these covenants or these dispensations are focused on Israel. This is their view. This is not Jackie's view. This is their view, just so you can understand. Uh, the covenant of promise is to Israel. Key points of the covenant of promise. Oh, it runs from Genesis 12 to Exodus 19.25. Um, so... Uh, key points from Abraham, there will come a great nation that God will bless with natural and spiritual prosperity. God would make Abraham's name great. God would bless those that blessed Abraham's descendants and curse those that cursed them. In Abraham, all the families of the world will be blessed, which is fulfilled in Jesus Christ and his work of salvation. The sign of the covenant is circumcision. This covenant, which was repeated to Isaac and Jacob, is confined to the Hebrew people and the 12 tribes of Israel only. So in their view, that is not for the Gentile. Next we have, from promise, we move into the dispensation of grace. That's where we are today. The dispensation of grace is a parenthetical uh, dispensation. That means... There was no sign of this dispensation in the Old Testament. It is a dispensation that was in the valley between two mountains. You guys ever heard that example before? One mountain being the promise to Abraham, the other the kingdom of Christ. And, and seated in the valley between those two was the church age, the, the age of grace. Um, so the stewards of this uh, dispensation is the church. The period runs from Pentecost to the rapture of the church. Uh, responsibility uh, to be perfected by sanctification, to love one another, to exhibit ever or growing in godliness together. Uh, the failure for this dispensation is a lack of maturity, worldliness, and apostasy. Uh, the judgment that will come upon this dispensation is apostasy and false doctrine. Uh, the grace is our sins are forgiven through Jesus Christ. So that's just a quick overview of the dispensation of grace. The last dispensation is the millennial reign of Christ. Thousand year reign of Christ that occurs after Christ returns. Uh, it is the final fulfillment of the Abrahamic, Palestinian, Davidic, and New Covenant. So under dispensationalism, those things, especially classic or traditional dispensationalism, those things 
aren't fulfilled in the church age, they are fulfilled in the millennial reign of Christ and they focus on Israel. So when we look at the uh, millennial reign, thousand year reign of Christ from David's throne, the period ends with the final judgment, uh, the great white throne judgment, new heaven, new earth, we all live happily ever after. That's a quick kind of overview of the dispensations. Now, there's a lot of, there, my whole life I have been a dispensationalist, but if you asked me, I would have said I'm not a good one because I struggle with the terms and all these, to, in my mind, in my mind, following the covenants makes more sense. There's a covenant in creation. There's a covenant with Noah. There's a covenant with Abraham, right? There's a covenant with David. There's a, there's a new covenant. There, we, we can follow uh, the Mosaic covenant. So we can follow the line straight through the Bible as they're presented to the people. Uh, now, I want to be fair. Dispensationalism does that. It's just with different names and it seems more complicated to me. Okay, that's just me. If, the, if, that's, uh, if that's your uh, system, God love you run with it and uh, and enjoy so i however uh struggle with some of the concepts so i first before we talk about too much more i want to talk about what we agree on i am a progressive covenantalist so i believe god reveals his plan progressively through the covenants in the old testament Unto Christ, Christ is the fulfillment of all the covenants. All the covenants are fulfilled in Christ. Christ is central to all history. This is what I believe. So um, dispensationalists would disagree with me on a number of points. We'll get to those in just a minute. But first, I want to talk about what we agree about, okay? Just in case anybody's panicking. Oh, my gosh, Jackie's part of a cult. <laughs> yes, I know. This wouldn't be the first time it happened. So, what are the areas of agreement? So, let's look at the areas of agreement. Uh, all orthodox doctrine is agreed upon. What does that mean? Both views believe the Bible is the inerrant word of God. Do you believe the Bible is the inerrant word of God? That the Bible is true, everything it tells us, everything it teaches us? Absolute final arbiter of truth is the word of God? Hallelujah. You know what? I believe that and so do dispensationalists um all we we both believe there is one god eternally existing in three persons that's called the doctrine of the trinity i know some of you right now are saying gosh i don't like persons okay eternally existent in three sub subsistences okay that's that, that come from james white he put that together but i don't care what you do it three in one okay the triune God. That's orthodox doctrine. Guess what? We both agree on that. Uh, mankind is fallen in nature, and as fallen, man is separated from God by sin. Guess what? Dispensationalists and progressive covenantalists believe that. All matters of orthodox doctrine are absolutely untouched, whichever system you take a look at. Um, the virgin birth. Everybody, both, both groups believe in the virgin birth. That seems good, right? Here's the best one. Both groups believe Jesus is fully God and fully man. That's a required doctrine in Orthodox Christianity. The fancy word is hypostatic union. <laughs> that means that in Jesus Christ, there are two natures in one being, human, divine. That's Orthodox Christianity. Both views hold that. Both views believe Jesus is sinless. You believe Jesus is without sin? You better, because that's what the Bible says. And if you believed point one, you should believe all the rest of these. Uh, Jesus is sinless. Do you believe that Jesus' death on the cross is our atoning sacrifice? It's the blood of Jesus Christ that sets us free from sin. Uh, do you believe that Jesus raised from the dead bodily? Wasn't his spirit that raised, he raised bodily. He walked around, people touched him, he ate, right? 
the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. Both believe that. Jesus' bodily ascension into heaven, that Jesus rose into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. Both believe that. Uh, both believe that Jesus is currently active in intercessory work in heaven. He ever lives to make intercession for us. Amen? It's what the Bible tells us. Is, I tell you, we agree on what the Bible says. Salvation is by faith through grace. Both, both views agree on that. That seems like a good thing, right? And last, both groups believe that Jesus will return bodily. He is coming back. So that's a lot to agree on, right? There are two things they disagree on. The two things they disagree on really make a lot of people mad. I don't know why. Uh, I was a little surprised, but, you know, live and learn. The two points of disagreement are these. Dispensationalists believe the church and Israel are absolutely distinct. Totally distinct. There are two peoples of God. That's dispensational view of Israel and the church. Progressive covenantalism's view is that the church and Israel are united and there is one people of God. The church and Israel are united and we believe that because the Bible says that. So there is, there is area of disagreement on that, the relationship between the church and Israel. Second point of disagreement for um, dispensationalism. <clears throat> well, what did I put that at the end? I should have read first. Eschatology. Dispensationalism, eschatology of dispensation. You guys know what eschatology means? I throw big words out and everybody doesn't know. Eschatology means the study of end. How, how's it all going to end? Okay, how's it all going to end? So dispensationalists are either pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, or pre-wrath, premillennialists. That's a lot of words, huh? Okay, the vast majority are pre-trib, pre-mill. So you guys, how many read Left Behind? If you read Left Behind, perfect. That is dispensational um, eschatology, pre-trib, pre-millennial. All right, the church is raptured, and then the, God's attention focuses on Israel because the Israel and the church are separate. God's attention focuses on Israel for the last seven years. At the end of the last seven years, the Lord returns uh, millennial age or the millennial kingdom of Christ and then new heaven, new earth like we talked about, okay? So that's dispensational eschatology. Under uh, progressive covenantalism, their eschatology is either historic premillennialism, postmillennialism, or amillennialism. Those are three other views of Orthodox Christianity about how things end. The difference between historic pre-mill and pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib uh, is this. Historic premillennialism recognizes that during Jesus' first coming, the New Testament interprets the old. The New Testament is a commentary on the Old Testament. And so... It holds precedent over Old Testament prophecies. You'll say, that's weird. Why, why would we care about that? Because there's this hang up between Israel and the church where they say, Israel's never possessed the land. Have you ever heard that? That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says at the end of Joshua that Israel received all the land that God had promised them and peace on every side. That's what the Bible says. In 
1 Kings 4, 20 and 21, it says during the reign of Solomon, they held the exact boundaries. The reality is Israel couldn't keep it. Why couldn't Israel keep the land? Because they were unfaithful, right? Unfaithfulness caused them to lose the land. We read that throughout the Old Testament, and then Jesus tells us that he would fulfill it. So Jesus fulfills everything Israel failed in, Jesus accomplishes. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? So where Israel was unfaithful, was Jesus faithful? Where Israel didn't always do the things God told them to do, did Jesus always do the things God told them to do? Was Israel called the son of God? Yes. Was Jesus called the son of God? Is he the son of God? Yes. So he comes and fulfills everything Israel couldn't do so that Israel could be saved. Through whom? Jesus Christ. Which we see happen beginning at Pentecost. Right? You remember when Peter preaches the first sermon? Who's getting saved? That's right. Israel is coming to know their savior. So I want to just go through a couple of scriptures. Uh, we'll get a little more in depth next time. So I won't have time to get too in depth. And next time we're only going to focus going through the covenants, drawing the line and, and hopefully being able to express, I probably stepped on something. Sorry. There, it's better. So, uh, <laughs> so next time I'll, 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 I'll connect all of those dots for for where I'm at and how that all fits, and hopefully that'll help you. But why am I convinced that Israel and uh, the church are united in one person? This is why I don't like it when people call me replacement. What does replacement mean? That the church did what? Replaced Israel. You, I don't say that. I said the Gentiles have joined believing Israel in one covenant people of God. So why do I say that? Okay, I'm going to give you guys some homework if you want to do it. The book of Galatians, the book of Ephesians, the book of Philippians, and the book of Romans. Read those, and you may come to the same conclusion I have. I'm going to give you a couple of verses from each one. Next time, we'll talk a little bit more about them. But I want you to consider these verses. In Galatians chapter 3. Verse 26 says, for in Christ, you are all sons of God through faith. So how many people are sons of God through faith? Okay, do you guys understand all means? Thank you. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed. You are Abraham's offspring and heirs according to promise. Do you understand what that means? You are heirs along with the covenant God gave to Abraham. You remember the covenant? A people nobody could count? More than the stars, more than the sand? Doesn't it make, make, make sense if that is all the saved? How does the Bible describe all the saved in the book of Revelation? An innumerable host of people from every tribe, nation, and tongue that cannot be numbered. Yeah. So... That's what it says in Galatians chapter 3. There's more in Galatians, but I only have three minutes left. So, like I said, next time we'll talk about it. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 11. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by the circumcision. Now, who's the circumcision? Yeah. So the circumcision is Israel, and the uncircumcision is everybody else, right? So you were called the uncircumcision by what is called circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ and alienated 
from the commonwealth of Israel, and you were strangers to the covenants of promise. You had no hope and were without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were afar off are brought near by the blood of Christ. Once you were outside the commonwealth of Israel, now you have been brought near. You are, as Galatians said, heirs together in the same promise. Ephesians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 3, verse 2 through 4. Paul writing to the church of Philippi. We just did Acts. So you guys all remember the church of Philippi, right? Remember the Philippian jailer? You remember when Paul went to Philippi? That's one of the places he didn't go to a synagogue. How come? Because there wasn't enough Jews there. You remember? There was a couple Jewish women that they met at the river. You guys remember the story, right? They met at the river, and that was the foundation, right? The beginning of the church that then poured out from the Jews who were there to the Gentiles in the region. So Philippians chapter 3, verse 2, he says, Look out for dogs. Look out for evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. He's talking about those who say you have to be circumcised to be saved. Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision. Or you, Paul's including himself with a bunch of Philippians that are mostly Gentiles. We are, the, what was the circumcision? Who, who gets circumcised? Jews, the nation of Israel, the only nation that was given the right of circumcision, right? He says, you are, for we are the circumcision who do what? Who worship by the spirit of God in the glory of Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. So Paul in Philippians chapter three calls a church mostly Gentile. He calls them the circumcision. He calls them the circumcision who, not because you're circumcised in the flesh, but because you worship God by the spirit. You worship God by the spirit of God and in the glory of Christ Jesus. No confidence in the flesh, all confidence in who? Who saves us? Jesus saves us, right? Okay, then Romans. I'm going to do, I'll probably just do two because I'm already out of time, but we'll get back to Romans next week. <coughs> Romans chapter 2, Romans chapter 9, Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 11, Romans chapter 12, or there's a lot of stuff in Romans. So, so don't worry, Romans is coming. Uh, on Sunday morning, we're doing Galatians next, so we'll study Galatians together, and then we're doing Ephesians, and then we're going to do Romans. So, so we'll eventually get there, but let me go through a couple of verses out of Romans. Romans 2, verses 28 and 29. For no one is a Jew who is one merely outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit not the letter his praise is not from man but from God not about the circumcision of the flesh it's about circumcision of the heart Romans 9 verses 6 through 8 but it is not as though the word of God has failed for not all who are from Israel belong to Israel. Well, isn't that interesting? Not everyone who is descended from Israel belongs to Israel. He gives us an example. Not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. According to Galatians, how do you become a child of Abraham? You become a child of Abraham by faith. You believe and it is accounted unto you Righteousness, just like Abraham. How was Abraham saved? Here, here's a real trippy part. Abraham wasn't a Jew when he was called. There was no Jews. <laughs> Israel as a nation doesn't exist until after the Exodus. So we take a look. He says, now, uh, they are not offspring of Abraham by birth just because their ethnic 
uh, uh, Israel, but through Isaac, your offspring will be called. Now, what does that mean? Remember, Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. Only one of those lines were the line of promise. What made it the line of promise? It was, it was going toward who? The line of promise is going to the promised seed, which is Jesus Christ, right? So that line goes through Isaac, not Ishmael. When we read the Old Testament, Israel was divided into two parts all the time. What are the two parts Israel is divided into? Believing the remnant or national Israel that didn't believe, those who went into judgment. Do we see those judgments throughout the Old Testament? God carries the remnant through, but not all of Israel was Israel, right? Only the ones that were through the promise, only the ones that were the sons of promise. Through Isaac will your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh, but the children of God, the children of the promise are counted as offspring. You remember what it said in Galatians chapter 3? By faith, what do you become joint heirs with? The promise. Today, today, if a Jew believes, he's still a Jew, isn't he? Sure. If an Italian believes, is he still an Italian? Is a, is a, Spaniard, a Spaniard believes, is he still a Spaniard? Sure, but, but where do they belong? They belong where? In the body of Christ. In Romans 11, which we'll talk about next time, in Romans 11, we're told that unbelieving Israel was cut off and believing Gentiles were grafted in. To what? So I don't care what you call it. I don't care what kind of tree you want it to be. I don't care. All I'm saying is all believers are grafted into one people. Believers. When I, when I, when I talk about the new covenant people of God, they are believers made up of every tribe, nation, and tongue. So that is why I say, or I see scripturally, not through some other book, I'm talking about what the Bible says, I was ta- saying scripturally that I believe that what God has done in Christ, that Christ, we'll talk about this next time, that Christ is Israel. And everyone in Christ, Israel is there too, right? You guys remember Pentecost. You guys remember the estimates when we talked about AD 70 and the destruction of the temple, there are, there are numbers, 30, 40,000 people a part of the church of Jerusalem. By the way, that's not a bunch of Gentiles in Jerusalem, right? That's Jews who are still part of Israel, right? So if Christ is Israel and all believers are grafted in to the same plant, now, the problem everybody hangs up on, we'll talk about next time. Where it says, at the end of uh, chapter 11, it says, um, all of Israel will be saved, right? Don't be proud if you're a Gentile grafted in, because if you don't believe, God will cut you off just like he cut them off, right? And, if, and though God cut them off, can he put them back in? Now, keep in mind, he didn't cut off all of Israel. All of Israel is not cut off. Them 12 disciples, that's Israel. Those Jews who believed in Jerusalem, that's Israel. And they are part of what we call today the church. But they're both part. There's not a replacing. There is a joining from every tribe, nation, and tongue. So... Next time, we'll get a little bit more into the details of that. I just didn't want to spend another day and tell you all these ideas and not talk about the word. So next time, 
I'm going to do just like we did through the dispensation. We'll do a quick review of the covenants. And then I'm going to talk about the things we ended today with, talking about why I think Israel and the church are united today. Uh, and then w what that means eschatologically. Where, where do we land then? So, um, so we'll talk about that next time, and then we'll jump into Genesis. Sound good? Uh, would you guys doing a song, or am I doing my thing? What do you want? You want to do Jared's song? You guys are, you spoil him. Don't spoil him so much. All right, well, I'll pray, and we'll close with Jared's song. Father God, we thank you for this time. We can study about your word. We can talk about the idea of, of systems and how they work and, and why there are disagreements, Lord. And I just want to be clear that everyone who disagrees with me is still my brother and uh, has nothing to do with salvation. This has nothing to do with whether or not you will be ready for the return of Christ. It has everything to do with uh, just being faithful to the word of God. So, God, I just pray that you would um, uh, help us find a way to unite the body of Christ in our differences. Because it was supposed to be the unbelievers that were scrambled at the Tower of Babel. It's not supposed to be believers. It's not supposed to be us who can't find our unity in Christ. For Christ is the center. Everything we do hinges off of him. He is central. So God, help us uh, uh, find our path to peace, uh, Lord, and to see the spirit of God moving through the church of God these days to bring people to the knowledge of Christ. So Lord, we give you thanks and praise for this time. We ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
demons run and flee at the mention of your name king of majesty there is no power in hell or any who could stand before the power and the presence of the great i am the great i am the great i am in all the things that we've learned about. But you're, you're greater. You're greater than any system. You're, you're greater than any church denomination. You're, you're greater than any uh, of these man-made things that man over the years has put together to worship you. And we're fallible, Lord. We're just, we are men. We're no different than all the men throughout history. All we can do is rely and hope and put our faith in you, that your spirit will lead us into all truth, as your word says. And that's what we are here for tonight. That's why we're studying, God. We want to know you. We want to be led into your truth. We want to build the foundation on the rock. And Father, you are the great I am. Jesus, you claimed yourself to be so many different things, claiming to be God and being God. We thank you that you are the door, that you've made a way for us. We thank you that you're the bread of life that you provide for us. We thank you that you're the light of the world, that you you help us to see, you give us light, you're the only light that we have. We thank you that you're the good shepherd that takes us and breaks us and brings us back. You keep us safe. You hold us in your hands that nothing would take us away. So tonight, Lord, I pray as we depart that our minds would stay fixed on you for the rest of the night, Lord. I pray that we would be families that worship together, that we would be families and and friends that celebrate you, that converse about you, that talk about you. That's all we do, Lord. You are the bread of life, and we want to live off of you. So we thank you, God. We thank you so much. We thank you for this place to gather. We thank you for the the fellowship that you give us, the relationships we have. And we pray that you would be glorified in all of it. You would get us all home safely. And again, God, I pray for everybody in here. I pray for everybody's families. And I pray, Lord, that you would just put a soberness in each of our minds that we wouldn't take for, for granted the time that we have with the ones we love. Help us to remember that, Lord, in Jesus' name.